welcome again to most everybody here. Uh, I'd like to call to order a regular meeting of the Town of, uh, Board of Trustees and Aspire Metropolitan District Number One Board of Directors. And Phyllis, if you call the roll. Sure. Mayor Andrew Buckle. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Lisa Skuma. Here. Trustees Joe Sorelli. Here. Dana DeSouza. Julia Gregoris. Here. Eric Rosenfeld. Deborah Williams. Here. Town Manager Scott Randall. Here. Town Attorney Tender Carberry. Here. Town Clerk Phyllis Harden. Here. Thank you very much. So item number three, uh, approval of the agenda. Entertain a motion. There are any changes to tonight's agenda? Motion by uh, Trustee Skumatz, yes? Motion, right. motion by you. Trustee Skumatz, second by Trustee Gregoris. Discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Item number four, uh, public comment on consent agenda and non agenda items. And uh, maybe the town, I, I suspect people are going to make more comments about the last topic. Uh, that's my gestalt feeling so maybe the uh, <laughs> what makes you say that uh, I don't know uh, but maybe the town attorney if you could just you already said this once but sure. why don't you say it one more time exactly what the process is sure. for the board to consider everyone's comments they'll have to be made at the time that the application is filed if it is ever filed the board can hear them tonight there's nothing wrong with them hearing your comments but for them actually to be considered by the board and part of the application and part of the review you'll need to come back at whatever date the application is considered by the board. And it may be, as I said earlier, it may be exactly the same application, there may be no application, or it may be an entirely different application. If Richmond heard what you were saying and there were specific comments about what could be changed, then maybe it's a different application. If they heard what you were saying and decided not to file one, there may be no application. Or they may ignore everything and come back and file exactly the same application. So it's entirely within Richmond's purview as what to file. And the board can't consider your comments as part of the application process until the application is actually filed with the town. So everyone is welcome, obviously, it's public comment to make whatever comment they would like to make. But I just wanted you to know the legal parameters of the board's role in this. Thank you. And actually, would it be, uh, if I could ask the town attorney a question. We have a, a guest tonight from the sheriff's department. I, I think we're probably going to have a lot of comment about the other issue. Would it be, uh, we don't usually do this because we just approved the agenda, but would it be okay to have the sheriff do his presentation first uh, and then have the comments afterwards? If it's, if it's acceptable to the board, that's I think that's a good idea. So motion by Trustee Skuma, second by Trustee Gurris. All in favor of that recommendation. Thank you. So uh, I'm assuming uh, won't be a hugely long presentation uh, and would like to... Does anybody want to argue with the sheriff? <laughs> <laughs> so, and welcome, and thanks for coming to the town board. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joe Pelly. I'm the Boulder County Sheriff, and I know we have some new board members, so I wanted to come tonight personally and say hello uh, to check in uh, as far as the contract for uh, municipal police services go. Uh, let you know that we are, we continue to be quite happy with the arrangement, feel that there are mutual benefits to both the county and the town. Um, and basically I'm here to see if there are any policy issues or questions. The um, presentation is actually going to be by your town cop, <laughs> Steve Cullen, Sergeant Cullen from the Sheriff's Office. He has some information concerning statistics and that kind of thing to share with you. I don't think it's going to take very long. And then if you have any follow-up questions, particularly at a policy level, I'm going to stay till he's done. Okay, All thanks right, very thank much. Uh, I, I guess I'll have one quick comment is that uh, at least I think I speak for the board, but uh, uh, personally I, I'm ex very happy with the uh, services that we've uh, received from the Sheriff's Department, and we're, we're glad that you're in our community, so thank you. Thank you. I'm Steve Cullen with Boulder County Sheriff's Office. Um, presenting the 2000-2008 annual budget, we kind of skipped a year. I apologize for that. So I've incorporated the statistics for 2007 and 2008 for comparison purposes. Um, basically what we'll go over is similar to what we did before, crime statistics, traffic, our detective activity, how do we compare to some of the other communities, and then just a couple items of note. Um, calls for service, and these are calls that are received in the dispatch center that people call into us. So these are the ones that are initiated by residents in town. Fairly consistent, that hasn't changed a whole lot. 2007, we saw a little bit of a spike, but we're staying, staying pretty pretty consistent. No real dramatic change in there. Um, deputy initiated calls, 
those are the calls that obviously the deputies initiate, whether it's traffic stops, whether it's contacting people, uh, follow-up reports, things like that. So again, fairly consistent. We were a little bit busier in 2008. That may show up a little bit probably with the traffic summonses they went up also. So you'll see, I think, that correlation with the deputy initiated calls in 2008. Um, crimes went down, which is, which is a good thing. So pretty significant. I think that's pretty consistent countywide. It's not unique to Superior. We are seeing crimes go down um, countywide, fortunately. Um, with the economic times, we'll see how that holds out. Sometimes with bad economic times, crime goes up. So we did have a significant drop. I don't have any real specific correlation as to why that is. Um, but it is a good thing because we were still receiving the same amount of calls for service. So whether it's the calls weren't as complex or the calls we were receiving for service weren't criminal in nature, it's hard to tell. So um, again, just kind of breaking things down a little bit more just for statistical purposes if anybody's really interested. Um, the one thing that I did note in here is the actual number of crimes is I, I went through and picked out the actual number of crimes. So the number of reports that we take, the crime reports we take, is going to be less than that. One crime report may contain several different crimes within it, and I put in all of the crimes that we reported. So we may have a, um, a burglary that also includes a theft and maybe a criminal mischief. For, for these purposes, I actually showed all of those, so you can see all of them. Although it may have only been one burglary, there may have been several crimes that are associated with it. Um, Again, breaking it down just so people can see. I know it's it's a lot, but I think um, gleaning from when I took over, I think this is kind of what the board wanted, real specific mm -hmm. ideas of what was going on in town. Um, it's real <coughs> difficult in this way to compare it to other areas. So when we get to the end, you'll see the UCR reports, which compare it to other towns, and that's really kind of what the best comparison is. So nothing real dramatic there. Um, <coughs> Pretty consistent, I think, with, with what you're going to see everywhere else. Again, this is a good example here. The domestic violence crime is usually associated with another kind of crime, a harassment or a third degree assault, that type of thing. So <coughs> that's where the duplication may show up there in those. Um, these are the property crimes. Um, if you remember our report from 2006, we had a huge spike in auto thefts. Fortunately, we actually did catch that group, and so auto thefts have dropped. Um, what has gone up, unfortunately, is trespass to motor vehicles. That's kind of the newest thing we're seeing. That is somebody breaking into a vehicle uh, when we call it a trespass. Um, that's, for better or not term, the newest trend. Um, people leave their cars unlocked. Um, we get people like, you know, just walking through. And it's not just Superior. It's Louisville. It's all the neighboring communities also. Um, going into cars, looking for easily stolen items, a lot of times people leave purses, checkbooks, credit cards, those kind of things. So that's the newest trend we have. Our detectives have um, moved on to some groups that I think we may associate back with Superior that were caught in, I think, Westminster, that we're being able to tie them back to some of the crimes in Westminster and Superior also. So they're, these people are typically from out of town and they're going all over the place. Um, illegal drugs, alcohol. This is the one area that is different, and that only one is the juvenile alcohol. Because I know that's always a, an item of interest. Those are the actual number of summonses that we did issue to juveniles. So that's the one area where that juvenile alcohol is the actual number of tickets that we issued to kids for, for underage drinking. Um, again, miscellaneous crimes, we just throw them all in there so people can see if there's any specific questions on anything, um, it's a lot to kind of digest. I do have a question about the mm -hmm. identity theft. Yes. Um, I noticed those are like 27, 28, 29, somewhere in that number. Is that similar to what we see in communities around the area? How how do we compare um, with other Those communities? I don't think are tracked yet, UCR, so, and I didn't pull them. I can certainly see. I don't know see. what UCR is. UCR is the Uniform Crime Reporting, which are the, um, the crimes that can be reported to the state and the feds, okay. and that's the easiest way to compare because it's the most consistent reporting mechanism. How about chatter um, among the, the I can the certainly I can certainly look and then check and, and 
uh, talk to other agencies and see where they're at. That's probably the other area that's the biggest rise, and that's a new, a new um, statute, if you will, the specific identity theft statute. And of course, that's huge nowadays with computer crime and um, credit card fraud. And, and like I wonder that. if that's that was related to this burglary of the cars thing. It can be. A lot of times we'll see uh, they'll breaking into cars or using the credit cards, things like that. Identity theft, a lot of times we do more for computer fraud if people get people's credit card numbers, um, obtain their personal information, and try and obtain credit in their, their name, things like that. So it, things get kind of murky when you get in there. There's a lot of different areas that you can um, charge people with. And it looked like harassment and domestic violence were also fairly strong. What is harassment? Harassment is basically below assault. Assault is physically hurting someone. Assault, harassment can be either physical or verbal. So it can be pushing someone. Uh, it can be verbally insulting them. There's a whole list of how it has to be fit a certain criteria. But it's, I mean, other terms use, you know, assault and battery type of thing. But we use assault for causing pain to someone. And if I strike you but I don't cause pain, then it falls under harassment. But it can also be verbal. Thank you. To where I insult you within certain parameters. And are any of the ones, how do we fall in terms of things that are sort of hate driven? Do we have um, an issue with hate as I've been hearing about some of our surrounding communities? I don't think so. I haven't seen it. We haven't seen a whole lot of hate crimes. I mean, that is a specific charge. Um, and I didn't see, when I went through the statistics, I don't think I saw any that were specific hate crime charges. And the other one I hear about complaints in the in the Front Range and, and the Denver area is a lot in terms of, um, and I don't know what crime it would fall under, mm -hmm. but it's um, you know, writing on walls. Graffiti. There you go. Graffiti. graffiti. Mm -hmm. yes. um, we are seeing an increase in graffiti. Senior woman, sorry. We are seeing an increase in graffiti. For us under here, it would fall under the criminal mischief because the town doesn't have a specific graffiti, and the state doesn't have a specific graffiti statute. The town doesn't either. So it falls under criminal mischief or defacing property, uh, where it's either damaging or defacing property. Um, we're seeing an increase of it. I think probably equivalent to Louisville in those areas. Um, some of it's kind of gang wannabes putting their monikers up, that type of thing, just trying to show that they're around type of thing. I have one last question. I'm not really trying to slow things oh, down. Sorry about that. Yep. Um, one of the other things I think that you guys provide a great service for is, you know, but I don't know, I can't tell from these statistics how many of the your calls are of this type. So where someone thinks something's happening, you know, you go out and you, and you just, and you're sort of monitoring for safety, monitoring for things that are, you know, maybe someone's not breaking in, but, you know, people are worried or there's some... Um, you, you know, it's really hard to break that down because that would fall under a call for service. So a deputy would get dispatched, you know, I think something's going on, um, the deputy will get there, investigate it. If it's truly not criminal, nothing suspicious, you know, it's the guy's brother-in-law that I've never seen before that's in the house. We don't take any kind of report or anything like that. But um, I think good response on those is a really good, a really good thing, and and I think it, it provides great community sort of outreach in that. So yeah, and we do. We respond to all of those, and we will investigate them. Um, I think the incident reports actually fall after the crimes, and there is a specific incident incident sorry. where it's a suspicious. Those are things that don't arise to a criminal level, but it's something that we want to document. It's significant enough that it's suspicious enough that we want to make note of it um, in case it continues, and then we've got it documented in everybody's information, that kind of thing. So there's a whole list of uh, incidents that I don't think are coming up after the crimes. But I think it's an important element of our citizens feeling safe. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it is very difficult to, to pull that out of crimes versus uh, you know the number of calls received as to actually what they came down and that would be out of 3,000 calls it would be real hard to <laughs> Thank you. you know we can say the number of crimes or the number of incident reports that came out of it I mean fortunately you know we've got 130 um, well we had 142 crimes we had 3,000 calls for service so wow. it shows that a significant number don't rise to the criminal level Great. So, again the same statistics for 2008 um, just to show what they are um, Again, the one that might scare people is the child abuse. Um, that one is one that falls under, can fall under other crimes also. We do charge child abuse if we arrest somebody for DUI and their kids in the car because they're putting the child at risk. Um, we also charge child abuse in certain domestic situations if they're violent domestic situations because they're potentially putting that child at risk. So those may not be 
what somebody might think of as the true child abuse actually injuring a child. Do you know if those three indecent exposures were that was that near a school? Uh, no, those were actually the horizons. No. And we did catch one person, and we are still trying to tie um, him to all three of them through DNA that okay. I don't think has come back yet. But no, uh, those were at the horizons. So. Uh, and then the attempted kidnapping, that was the incident at the Wild Oats Market. Oh, yeah. Where we had the, the lady that left the Wild Oats Market. Somebody uh, attempted to do that from there. So that's why I put down there that it was a little different. Again, um, auto thefts went on a rise a little bit this year. I think we're seeing that with the crease with the trespasses. We're seeing, again, the different groups that are kind of cycling through. Um, we're seeing things where they're stealing cars and coming here and stolen cars. Uh, they're stealing those cars and going somewhere else to commit other crimes elsewhere. Type of thing. So there is still groups filtering through. They, unfortunately, they see it as a safe community, and I don't want to say easy pickings, but they see that you know it's not you know Westminster or something where people are really alert. People here, you know, you still have people here saying they don't feel they have to lock their doors. Which I mean, it's nice to have that safe feeling, but it is kind of a false feeling anywhere nowadays. I mean, it, it, there's no place that you really should not lock your doors and car um, Again, the same uh, drugs, juvenile alcohol, again, those are the actual number of, of citations this year, 14, that was down about half this year. And I think that's down pretty significantly even from years before. I think it was much higher in 2006, so that's good. Uh, and then miscellaneous crime, so I think there's any real there. Uh, these are the incident reports. So these are the ones that don't arise to the criminal level. Um, they're down a little bit also. And so this is how we divide them up. We have a whole list of them. This isn't even all of them. I just narrowed it down to the ones that, you know, we get the most type of thing. Um, so that's where you'll see the suspicious incident you were looking at down here at the bottom, seven, that arose to that level that the deputy felt they needed to document that incident, but that it wasn't criminal. Officer information, that's kind of a catch-all. You know, if it's something we, we need to document, we want to document, but we just don't have another block to fill it. We keep put it in there. Uh, and then the 2008 ones are <coughs> fairly consistent, I think. Uh, animal control, as you know, uh, you contract also with animal control. That stays pretty consistent. They keep pretty busy um, during the year. And they, um, they're responsible for other districts. They are not, there's not an animal control officer that's assigned specifically to town. So along with the calls they receive in town, they're handling all their calls in the other districts and areas. So they keep pretty busy and pretty consistent. Um, these are the violations. Again, a lot of these, out of those 600 calls they receive, we have 53 violations. I mean, it can be, you know, there's a dead cat in the road. I mean, that's a lot of the calls they get. Um, rattlesnakes. In the, wheel, in the window wells, things like that, raccoons, uh -huh. not raccoons, uh, yeah. prairie dogs, item, animals in the window wells, they respond or at least get calls on all of those and will help people to try and you know, deal with getting those out. So that's where a lot of those come in. Again, they don't arise to the, the level of a crime. And then, again, pretty consistent, I think, for 2008, dog at large is probably the biggest complaint. Obviously, the biggest citation we get people letting their dogs run at large. Uh, traffic, like I said, that's probably where a pretty significant amount of our officer initiated calls. We have the um, we have the hourly deputy that worked through about the first half of the year, and then he uh, went off to Afghanistan, so we lost him. We are still supplementing the traffic in high areas, school zones specifically, so we're still doing pretty good, um, concentrating on school zones in the highest areas of um, complaints. And again, just for specific incidences, obviously parking's a big one, that's 95% the horizons and the fire lanes in the horizon, so it's always, and it's something we fought with since we uh, went through and designated those fire lanes, and it's just, there's just not enough parking over there for the number of people they have, but it is, it is a very potential 
very hazardous situation for cars parked through there. We can't get a fire truck or an ambulance through there. So we do kind of hit that kind of hard. Speeding, of course, is, is the biggest one. And that's probably to be expected. With a huge increase to the next year. Yeah. Yes. Um, <coughs> we have heard that the signs that we, the new signs that we posted are doing well. The one on McCaslin, the deputies are saying, I can't catch anybody there. So I mean, that's good. I mean, the idea is to slow people down. Um, so those do work. They are working well. Um, again, very similar. High speeding, high parking violations. So how did speeding go from 534 to 807 to 830 and 08? Um, I think it's a little bit more consistent with the hourly deputy that we that we got brought in that handled his focus was strictly on traffic. Okay. So And that was real cyclic. We had the hourly deputy. We would lose one. It would take us a while to replace them. So it, it kind of went cyclic um, with that as far as the ups and downs of how busy that person was. We added a full-time body in 2008 as well yes. and devoted that body to aggressive traffic enforcement. Yeah, that was the new deputy that we added. Uh, traffic accidents remaining fairly consistent. Um, I'd like to say that the, the aggressive traffic enforcement has helped with that, but it hasn't. Um, a lot of that is, you'll see them on side streets. Um, Marshall and McCaslin is, is a pretty high area for accidents. Um, we are seeing a little bit more increase. I know the traffic circle was always an interest. I think the first year, I think we had very few in the traffic circle. Um, we're seeing more and more there now. Some of it is weather-related. Um, if we get ice on the roads or something, they'll slide right through the traffic circle. I think the other part of it is probably people are more familiar with it now. Maybe test their bounds a little bit more. Um, they don't slow down as much as they should when it was a new type of thing. So we are seeing a few more in the traffic circle. And again, same thing. A few more in the traffic circle, side streets, and Marshall and McCaslin. That seems, Marshall and McCaslin seems to be, and they're usually more significant on Marshall and McCaslin. Um, people running through the lights. Uh, how do we compare traffic statistics? Uh, Superior, Erie, Louisville, Lafayette. I didn't, Lafayette didn't return in time for this when I requested their statistics. So uh, if and when I do get those, I'll forward those to the board uh, to update them. Um, pretty consistent. We're a little bit higher than Louisville. Um, DUI, I would expect us to be a little bit lower than the other towns. We don't concentrate. You know, They concentrate within their town specifically for the DUIs. And it's a little bit different dynamics, not as many you know, businesses and restaurants and bars type of thing in town. So I would expect those to be a little bit lower. Um, traffic accidents, Louisville obviously got double. Erie probably pretty consistent for our size. Why do you think um, the traffic summonses is so much higher and superior than Louisville? Um, I think part of it is probably, again, our, our dedicated person for that. I don't know if Louisville has somebody they dedicate to just traffic. I don't know how they assign their officers or if it's strictly as they normally patrol type of thing. Uh, detective activity with the rest of the crimes, they went down pretty significantly. So, um, but again, that is, is, I think, department-wide, our detective call is, is down, which is a good thing. I mean, it's getting a chance for them to catch up and um, really work some of these cases a little bit more aggressively. The identity theft cases, all of those, um, are much more difficult to investigate, take much more time. So there are subpoenas and records and everything like that. So um, the crimes are becoming more sophisticated, which unfortunately takes more time. Uh, these are the UCR reported crimes that I talked about before. So these are the ones that are reported to the state. These should hopefully be a little bit more consistent. There are guidelines that every agency is supposed to report these by. Um, I did put in the per capita, like Trustee Schumacher that's request. That's <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I mean, you can you can take from it what you want. I mean, we're pretty, we're a little bit higher, we're a little bit lower in the assaults. I mean, we're high in recent robbery, though. Yeah. Except one uh, didn't work out there for the thefts, mm -hmm. uh, for the per capita. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea, comparison-wise, where we're at to the to the other cities. So I don't know if there's any specific questions on those. Uh, just the demographics again, just to show how we do compare. Um, we did go up one officer this year, so 
our officers per capita changed a little bit. And again, for the supervisors, this since the town has just a sergeant, which is my level, and below assigned to the town. Those are the only ones I, I put up here. I didn't include all our administrators, um, commanders, uh, lieutenants, uh, division chiefs, all that above as a comparison. It really wouldn't, it would skew it, it, it wouldn't make sense. So Is I, Erie and uh, Louisville including those or not? No, no. When I pulled these out, I, I did specifically officers and detectives and, and pulled them out. So this is okay. the, the equivalent. It's their, their sergeants and below for working in, in operations around the street or their sergeants and below working in detectives. So, so um, how do you think this uh, reflects on Superior compared to Louisville, Lafayette, and Erie? Um, I think we're doing a heck of a job for half the deputies. I mean, I think we're, we're doing a real good job. And I think that's where it shows um, the cost effectiveness to the town because a lot of the reason you have that many officers is because that's what it takes to have your own police department to actually run 24/7 with um, sick calls, vacation days, all of that. That's what it takes to man your own police department. It's not uncommon in a traditional hierarchy to have one supervisor for every two and a half to three people, and the fact that we're operating with a staffing of eight and one is incredibly efficient. I applaud you for setting this up. I applaud Joe for giving us this level of service. Uh, we don't have, we're not top heavy, we're on the street. We, get, we seem to get very great, very good value. Yeah. Really good and, the, and the nice thing about the contract too is you don't get just those seven officers. I mean, right. when something happens in town, if it's big enough, you get every officer that's working in the street. Um, we had that, I can't remember what the call was we had here. We had our SWAT team. That, oh, it was the kidnapping. Yeah, it was the whole food incident. It was the whole food kidnapping. Mm -hmm. Our SWAT team happened to be training up at the, the their hate property. Space house. We had 20 SWAT officers, in town, which a lot of people didn't appreciate it because they saw them walking through their backyards. But it shows that kind of service. Where in, in Louisville or Erie, you'd get the officers that are working the street, which could be three or four type of thing. And so, if we only need half a detective, we only pay for half a detective, which is pretty great. Yeah, I think I think we're paying for a full detective right now. Yeah. So, yeah. But again, you get the full detective bureau. Um, Fortunately, we haven't had a homicide in town. So we're, <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Um, but you'll get the full protect. You'll get all ten of them. You know, and when we had the auto thefts, we had three or four working those. You know, they went to grand jury. So you don't get just that one body. You get the whole group. And I think that's really where the benefit to the town comes in with the contract. Uh, the one special item note that I put in here is we work with the court clerk. Um, the county had been doing this for quite a while, where previous to this, a juvenile could receive a speeding ticket and pay it, and his parents would never know. So um, this is kind of the trend that this, the state and the county got to it. So we finally, it's just starting now, where there's actually a spot on the back of the summons. If they want to pay it to mail it in, the parent has to have a notarized signature huh. to mail it in. Right. They can still come to court, and in this court, they have to bring their parents. So one way or the other, the parent of a juvenile is going to be notarized. We think is important. It's a great idea. Um, I did add just a couple of things. Just we enjoy doing some of the extra events. I didn't put the pictures in. I didn't think they'd print up. We do uh, come out to Superior Days where we do canine demonstrations. Um, we also had a SWAT demonstration which went over real well, showing a lot of our SWAT equipment for Superior Days. Um, we always enjoy the Fourth of July parade. <laughs> so we're right behind the fire truck with their sirens. Going which one are you, Steve? Um, the one punched over for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our old Willie's Jeep and our new mobile command post, which actually we had out at the Chili Fest also, which I think got a lot of uh, good PR there. Uh, Kent said he had a lot of people that were real interested. We open it up and give tours to stuff, so hopefully we'll have it out again and kind of show it off type of thing. So. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you very appreciate much. it. Uh, let's see. Any other questions from the or otherwise, uh, if anybody wants to speak to this particular issue from the audience, then name and address if you wouldn't mind at the podium. Yes, I, uh, my name is, uh, oh, sorry, that is an uh, 813 This This is officially reported, so, okay. yeah. The mic. Okay. Apostle Zesley's 813 Maroon Peak Circle. I noticed two things here which are really great. Where you saw the summons that they were 2,000 compared to um, uh, Louisville. Uh, 
we had half, we had double the summons, but half the accidents, which is the right way to go. Uh, if you notice that, so I'd rather have someone that have accidents, you know, any time. The other thing you mentioned there, I have a question for you. You saw that the detective had about 140 cases or so. How many of them? What's the percent of them that he solved? Was it 100 percent? Um, no, I don't have that. I can give it. I certainly isn't 100 percent. Um, Sixty-eight percent. Okay, yeah. and those are the detectives typically get just the felony cases. Okay. So um, the burglaries, the felony assaults, um, yeah. any of the misdemeanor cases we assign back to our the deputies working in town to work. So they can just the Sixty-eight percent is our overall assault. I don't know what it is specifically. Okay, no, that's good. Well, that's close. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, once again, we're we're. Excited about you being in the community, and it's uh, been helpful for us and hopefully helpful for the Sheriff's Department as well. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. I think we're open. Yeah. <laughs> public comments. Yes, now we're moving back to the uh, public comment section of this. So, good evening. Uh, Steve Smith, 653 Eaton Circle. Um, I don't have a comment about the uh, land issue tonight. I've got some comments about some other things. Um, first half of this conversation is uh, comments made by me as a representative of the Rock Creek HOA. Uh, the first thing I'd like to make is congratulations to the board. Great job on the library issue. I think you guys uh, did a great job, and we're glad you worked that all out. So we appreciate that. Um, one of the uh, issues I wanted to bring to your attention uh, this evening, uh, we got a call from the Ridge uh, indicating that the town manager sent a letter out uh, talking about breaking their contract early and joining the town. The rumor is, is that this was a letter that says you have no choice but to do this. If we could get some uh, comment on that either in this meeting or at some point, I'll tell you what my concern is. We have been through this trash issue so many times it's just overwhelming. It's getting tiresome. And we've asked the town, with their agreement, not to mess with the Rock Creek trash issue. And this thing at the ridge, for whatever it's worth, looks like a stepping stone into breaking our contract. And we're asking the town maybe just lay off. The economic things are getting tight. There's always a question when this kind of activity goes on as to what the town is up to. Are they trying to get more fee money? Where is this headed? So it, my request is is that if uh, the town could back off on the trash issue, you guys got bigger fish to fry than this. Let this thing go. Um, so if you want to make a comment on that, I'll stop a moment because I have one more uh, issue. Sure. Uh, and I, I think that the, um, my understanding is that they voluntarily wanted to join the contract, so I'll have to leave this to the town managers mm -hmm. since I, I don't deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Two issues. First of all, when the board took its action in January of 2008, the board identified three neighborhoods, three subdivisions, which were to be served by the town's global contract. That was Sagamore, Original Town, and The Ridge. Uh, when we executed our agreement with Waste Connections in July of 2008, it included The Ridge. After that contract was signed and executed, we found uh, Waste Connections wasn't aware that they had a contract with The Ridge. The Ridge HOA wasn't aware that they had a contract with The Ridge. Uh, with, with Waste Connections. We've worked for the last six months to try to work it out. The Ridge HOA still wants to come under our contract. It's cheaper than what they're paying, and it has better levels of service. That was confirmed, reconfirmed today in a meeting that I had with the HOA at 5 o'clock this afternoon, and we're continuing to pursue it. I don't know what correspondence, but hearsay and rumor mill uh, is inaccurate. Okay. So very so. good. If we uh, have evidence that's contrary to that, we could bring that to your attention at we a later date. Sure. All right, thank you very much. The other thing I wanted to bring uh, up is these uh, new street signs. Uh, they're awesome. They're lighted, and they blow down every time the wind blows. <laughs> so I don't know if this town is doing something. Go back to the manufacturer and ask them why their uh, uh, signs can't hold up to the wind around here or what it is, but it seems an awful waste of uh, money to keep replacing these things. And I'm sure that, uh, Lisa, you don't appreciate the landfills filling up with all of our signs. So uh, if you guys could address that issue with us, let us know how that's going and to see if the uh, manufacturer of those signs are going to do something about it. Okay. Uh, I think that that's my last co comment. Uh, by the way, the last comment there, just for the record, was a personal comment, not an HOA comment. <laughs> there you go. Right, thank, thank you. you. Lotus 4G 404 7, 3rd Avenue. 
Uh, I'm presuming that uh, since the rest of the work session agenda tonight wasn't handled because of the main issue that that they will come back up at another time? Uh, I don't think I quite understand. Home rule. Home, home rule. rule. Home rule. Well, oh, the home, home rule, rule, yes. And then uh, there's also, um, um, well, I guess the home rule is basically, yeah. The board decided that it, you know, uh, I understand. that it was, people wanted to talk about that and while well, home rule is an important issue and we all want to go to home rule and we want to move our elections to November, just that my is, little, that is okay, I'm done sir. now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that in the future. Okay, so the home rule will be discussed another time. Okay, um, I'm uh, also wondering um, when the date will be set for um, the work session on the infrastructure project in the south edition of our regional town superior. I think she's asking when the work session is on the on the on the infrastructure on the yeah this isn't on and this is a year global, CIP it's not yeah. this isn't about original town per se it's about the global about infrastructure the, project the global streets program yeah. it is scheduled for the second Monday in March which was the first uh, available date that the board was available able to meet thanks I don't remember the exact day I think it might be the I was going to ask for your report so good okay um, the um, on tonight's agenda under the consent agenda um, Number 6F, the preliminary approval. Um, I would like to, um, I'm presuming that this is the time when there would be a discussion held about that? Uh, sure, make comments. It's, this is the, uh, the initial reading, so it's coming back around for the, for the adoption. But yeah, you can, this is the time. Well, I have two pages of comments, and I don't think you want to take time for all of my comments okay. now. And so I'm asking, um, as to when a time can be set um, to discuss in detail uh, the code chapter 11. Uh, my specific <coughs> ones are section 11130 and 11140 and 112160. Okay, next meeting, I think, right? This is coming back around? Is yes. That, yep, so that's, second, that's the official reading. time to do this, but well, I'd always recommend time to do it. Well, the next meeting. One. 2160. 11 to uh, My only comment also would be if you could, it'd be good to get that in advance of that discussion so we can think about that. It's hard to react sometimes. Oh, I don't in the have meeting. a problem typing it out. And I know. It to exactly. You. So, <laughs> forward it on. Uh, but I, the <laughs> residents need to have input in this. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Mr. Mayor, that the sidewalks in original town has been a massive discussion in the past mm. and I feel that now is the time to um, uh, make some corrections on these and um, amendments and deletions and, and that sort of thing. So okay. uh, that's what I need to do then is to email you. I, I'd recommend it in the, uh, to do it in advance because it's hard to react right in the middle of a meeting. Well, it, and, and like I say, it, it's long and with everything sure. else that's going on tonight, I, it would just be much easier to, um, uh, to do that. Okay, uh, let's see. I have comments about Richmond also, but um, since this will be before the um, Planning Commission and the process on down the line, I think you'd probably be happy with my comments. I don't live in Rock Creek, but um, uh, you all know that I have been absolutely irate about the executive um, Meetings and I feel that this is um, at this stage because of this. I have one other thing, and that is um, what and when is something going to be done about the stinking house that's setting a second and Cold Creek Drive in original town that has been there since September 21st and nothing has been done? Okay, it's on, it's on the list. I don't think we'll be able to react to that tonight. So. But. I have asked about this before and I have gotten no response whatsoever okay. from any of you. And so why can't there be an answer given to me? And soon. Okay. Okay. Soon? When can I expect a reply? Uh, 
send me uh, I'm happy to meet up with you offline send me an email comment or phone me at the house I think my phone number is it it's it's in the book or uh, on I, the town I will newsletter, send you an so. email sir yeah. I have no problem doing that yep yeah. I send emails and I never get any response back from a lot of them okay. and I'm not the only one president in town that happens but I will take it that since you have told me to send emails regarding these two issues that I will get responses. Or you can call me at the house. So you know where to find me. Uh, more, just one correction. The um, work session is on March 16th, 16th. which is yeah. the third Monday. Oh. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So that means, Goody, we get to drive on the rocks and around the edge of the rim of the, of the pipe that will split our wheels. We get to do all of that before this. Uh, well, that that's different that's an topic, really. I think. This is what we're talking. That work session is talk talking about our twenty-year maintenance plan. Um, no, it's not. I sent an email out on February third to John Hawka, Scott Randall, with a CC to the mayor and the town board, complaining about this. Just, just to be clear, though, that this is a more global discussion, and it doesn't have to do with the original town. It has to do with our three million dollar. I don't remember the dollar figure, but our th annual three million dollar infrastructure improvement plan. Yes, so, priority setting and all the rest of that. Correct. I'm talking about a work session regarding the street project in Original Town. That Duly I got noted. an email from a town board member on February 5th saying that she had asked for a work session. Um, Regarding that, I asked for a work session about regarding the, the streets work prioritization. Prior exactly. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Um, so why can't we have some response from the town board about this infrastructure project that is just an ugly, ugly situation in Original Town? Uh, so. Let's see. I guess I'll respond here. So uh, there probably many people in the room aren't aware of what's happening. There was an infrastructure project in an original town where we repaved streets and put in curb and gutter. Uh, there was part of that that was not installed due to weather-related issues, and that's happening as soon as the weather it comes to the point where we can actually put pavement in. So There are other problems with that project, and you have all been told that. Okay. And that's what I'm talking about, that I have sent emails and nobody listens. Nobody responds. Nobody comes down, looks at it, and sees what the problem is. Okay. Why? Well, I think everybody on the board has actually been there. I've so. been down there, but there's still nothing being done to correct the problems. This goes back to a bigger sort of beauty is in the eye of the beholder business. You know, we think that we have installed a good infrastructure for original town the curb and gutter I know that you disagree with us but it doesn't mean that necessarily it's wrong we have to sometimes agree to disagree and I guess that's where we're at right now the town did not contact the fire department before that project was done about the width of the streets down there okay. for one thing all right but, um, I'm happy to talk about you uh, about this with you offline but we need to to move on if we could. That, that's all I needed to hear was at least you will talk about it because as I've said I've got no response from my email. Okay. So that's three things now that you and I are going to discuss. Is that correct Mr. Mayor? Sounds good and, and you're aware that we have met uh, before. So. Yes I am. You also are aware that I complain a lot. <laughs> yes we know. <laughs> I pay my Yes, you do. Now on to the more light-hearted subject of the town swap. I am Sandy Pennington, 3002 Micah Court. I am here to repeat the comments made in the planning in the work session so that they become part of the public record. And, and once again, just for the, I, I want the attorney to reiterate what she said at the beginning of this, which is if you really want it to be part of the public record, it needs to be part of the 
hearing uh, when this comes forward. Respectfully, so. Mr. Mayor, I'm what I'm trying to do is also there were several hundred people who could not be sure. here tonight who want to be informed about the issue, and yes. I might be making my Hollywood debut here on this camera. There we go. So we're, we're happy to hear it. I just okay. wanted to be clear about what the process is. I'll try to summarize. Um, and so if you're watching on the screen there, you can email me, and I'll give you more detail. Um, I want to make uh, five points and several suggestions uh, regarding the, the swap issue and the b potential build out of the property in, um, adjacent to El Dorado K-8. Um, we have several concerns about that. It should be made, first it should be made clear that before we homeowners entered into our purchase agreements on that property, many of us actually researched what would be done both with Calmonte and what would be done with um, the property in question. I researched it personally at Town Hall and with BVSD in person, and we were handed a document called the 1995 Intergovernmental Agreement that expressly states that if the property does not become school property by 2014, it will revert at no charge to the town of Superior for express development as open space, parks, playgrounds, game field, libraries, or municipal government service offices. A memo by then a town, a town attorney, Kathleen Haddock, reconfirmed this in 2001. Many of us home buy owners based our buying decisions on these representations. Then on January 12, 2009, this area effectively was rezoned from open space to residential space unilaterally without rezoning hearings, without notifying affected property owners, or seeking their comment. The legality of this, I think, is seriously in question and should be addressed. We're going to do it as homeowners. I would suggest the city also do that. Secondly, the town, by its own admission, did no impact studies of the potential impact of this development um, on El Dorado K-8, on traffic safety, drainage soils, economic impact market impact, no economic impact studies. Um, for those of us living in the affected area, these are real day-to-day -day issues that we contend with. Also in recent action, the town rewrote its notification requirements, um, narrowing the number of homeowners who need to be notified to 500 feet of the development. In such a situation where the entire community is affected, that 500-foot notification is really way too narrow. And I would contend, again, citing the proposed town center, if that same 500-foot restriction applied, not one homeowner lives within 500 feet of that development. Hence, by your own rule, none of us would have to be notified. So that needs to be readdressed as well. Fourthly. Um, to go to the issue of the character of the neighborhood. I want to uh, um, put on the record um, what uh, Scott Randall said twice during the uh, planning session or the work session that any developer of this uh, acreage is bound by two requirements. One, lot sizes that are no smaller than exist now in the subdivision in the near vicinity. I'm, I'm assuming this means Crestwood, um, and home size is no smaller. Despite this, by, via the amendment you approved at the, February, uh, the January 12th meeting, you approved a minimum lot size no smaller than 60 by 100. That is totally out of whack with the current minimum lot size of 70 by 110, correct, Scott? that now exists in Crestwood. That's 1,700 square feet worth of difference. Um, Richmond now states somewhere in the middle of that. They have said 60 by 100. They have said 65 by 100, I believe that. Tonight they said 65 by 110. I'm a journalist, a trained journalist, so trust me, 65 by 110 is what they said tonight, but they're a moving target. Um, so that needs to be revisited, and I believe this, these 
things have to be applied to the letter of the law. The second thing is that home sizes be no smaller than currently exist in the near vicinity. The current home sizes in the near vicinity, I've got documented all 59 lots in the contiguous area to this. The smallest home size is 2696, and that's one home. We have two at slight, uh, four at, at somewhere between 2728 and 2778, so in that 2700 range, and all the rest are larger, and some of them significantly larger, double. Um, Anyway, tonight what we, what we have heard at the two previous meetings on this is that Richmond intends to build the heritage and infinity models, which range from 23 to 2,400 square feet. That in no way represents the near vicinity as evidenced by the fact that the absolute smallest home in the near vicinity now is 2,696, with the largest home at 4,382. Um, tonight, Richmond gave an, a range of 2,200. They broadened on the downside and extended to the upside of 4,400. And I would lay out there that we've got to be extremely vigilant that we don't have one 4,400 square foot house and all the rest which come in at the smallest, establishing a new small for the area. So that, I think, is de facto evidence that the character of the neighborhood is intended to be changed. Um, that, as well as getting rid of the only open space we have in that community, materially affects the development as well. Um, the third thing is the build-out time that has been discussed. At the November 07 meeting, the build-out time was said to be 18 months to two years, maybe two and a half years. At the February 2nd work meeting, or that, the gratis meeting that Richmond had with us, they said the build out would be three to three and a half years. Tonight, they said um, uh, up to four, year, uh, four years, uh, and I want to say they may have added something to it. Uh, it could be a four year build out process, they said. And the fact is, gentlemen and ladies, we don't know what that build out process is going to be. The gentleman truthfully should have said we won't know because we're only going to be build two specs at a time and the, the market itself will determine if that build out goes into 10 years. If there's not demand, that build out will go however long it takes to build out. And four, they said we'll have a combination of ranch and two stories. And as I confirmed here tonight and Scott um, probably can confirm, there are absolutely no ranches currently in the Crestwood section of Rock Creek. Um, so uh, um, going on to number five point to make is that uh, the huge amount of dissatisfaction which we saw tonight when I would estimate we had about 150 people here tonight and the huge majority held their hand up when asked if they have current issues with Richmond in terms of home maintenance and living up to the contractual agreement. Yet the town without an open bid process, without inviting the other big developer here, here, Goldman Design, is proceeding to even hear something from Richmond. And as we said tonight, is um, no to Richmond. No, not in, uh, no to Richmond until they make good on the damage they've done to this community so far. So three suggestions quickly. One, we would ask for a delay in the town's process until we can consult legal counsel about the legality of the unilateral rezoning, the changes in the notification requirements. We would also ask you to conduct a mandate, an impact study be done on such issues as auto and pedestrian traffic, drainage, soils, community impact and economic impact. And three, uh, three should the ultimate decision be made that uh, in, in collaboration with the community, that build out is is a good thing. We would ask that that we uh, enlist other developers in that process, and that's where I said no to Richmond unless they make good on the problems they've caused. And then I've had another one added here that any notification of anything regarding this issue be broadly made. We now have in place the CAC, that Citizens Advisory Communication thing, on your own website. Trust us, we're all on it now. 
could you please put it over that, that there will be a work session to go through this all so that we can uh, be here and we can respond. Um, and with that, uh, consider increasing the 500-foot notification requirement. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Trustee Williams. Can I ask you a question? Yes. If if open space were not a consideration, what other than obviously you're not happy with uh, homes, residential, what would you be happy with in that? What we long for, and we've shown, we voted for in any place we've been able to vote, is a park. We have no manicured space, not one protected square inch. There's no manicuring around like behind my house right next to the sidewalk, but nothing where anybody could play on. We want to park there. We want a beautifully manicured space, um, you know, along the quality in Purple Park so that the kids adjacent to the school is a logical place. So we have picnic tables, places for families to hang out and kids to play. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. First of all, I've heard you loud and clear. Thank twice, you. Twice tonight, so I appreciate your comments. But you have brought up, and some other residents have brought up, the no open bid right. with Richmond. I'm not sure you can have an open bid when they own the land on Colton and McCaslin, which is, is being swapped. So this is not open bid in that sense. We uh, go back to the advisability of doing that. The city will own, and according to the legal documentation I have. The city can take ownership of this property at any time at no cost, and particularly after 2014, because at 2014 the school gives up all rights to that property. Right, that's so you, uh, the city never has to conduct this swap. That commercial development along Colton can occur absent city ownership. It can occur with Richmond ownership if Richmond ever decides to do so. And I would contend Richmond is holding that as their ace in the back pocket, trying to force you to do this inadvisable deal by El Dorado K-8. I mean, Richmond's a commercial builder with national building. They want this, so they've got the ace in the pocket for you, but it does not have to occur that way. You guys can take ownership of this property. If Boulder Valley really does not need it, and has no intention for it, you can take ownership of it tomorrow at no cost. It accrues to you. Richmond simply has to do the maintenance on the property. And you could start building that park tomorrow. So hold on a minute. So let me ask you this question, um, Mr. Randall. Uh, this particular property after we take over it in 2014 or at any time, can it be used for anything other than public use? Not governed by the existing agreements, only by amended agreements. Sandy's correct. We could turn it into a park today. We could have turned it into a park when, we, when this agreement was first executed in 1995. It didn't happen. We had to give it up and would have to give it up if the school came forward with the financing in place in which to build a school by December 31st, 2014. Clearly, they're not going to do that. We all know that BBSD just did a $300 million bond issue, and it didn't include any money for, for a new facility in Superior. Okay. So uh, should we take that property over? Could we build homes on it? It has to be amended. No. The board would have the ability and has the ability to rezone that property and use it for any purpose that it so chose. Then let me ask you one other question. Um, how would that neighborhood and the people in that neighborhood feel about using it for public use other than park? and um, open space, such as a library, a rec center. How would they feel about that? I think that? very positively. You do? Right. You don't think that traffic would be an issue, people coming and going? It would have to be managed. Absolutely, it would have to be managed. But uh, right now, we've got an undeveloped uh, eyesore. Looks a little bit, little bit sort of moonscape-ish over there. 
Um, so uh, development-wise, community-oriented, community-beneficial development of any kind, I believe, would be definitely something we would all consider, but would, I think, involve us in the process. Okay. Right, and of course, that was what was intended under the IGA as well. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate Thanks. it. Grant Jacobs, 1345 South Pitkin. I'm just curious if the uh, work session is televised or not. Because no. it would have been helpful to, to televise it since it's such a contentious issue. And also, I stood out in the hallway because it was congested and couldn't hear a word, and the TV out there wasn't even on. So it would be helpful to include those people that don't have the ability to actually gain entry into the uh, hall here by, as a courtesy, having the TV on and allowing them to, to follow the proceedings. Also, I think that any development in Superior should include all residents, just like when we all voted on the open space issue, because I don't believe uh, limiting it to 500 feet uh, in proximity to any development is fair to other residents in Superior. I think we should all be noticed and all have a chance to participate. Thanks. So again, I'll, I'll uh, just repeat my facts again. And and then you'll I, I had to remind uh, name and, name <laughs> and I'm Christine Davies at yeah. 2943 Marble Lane. Um, from the Town of Superior Roadway Design Criteria and Standards, um, the Town of Superior Street Standards recognize the need to balance safety, efficiency of service, livability, and economy. Um, and in asking what is safe, what is a safe and livable street, it suggests the tolerable limits appear to be less than 800 vehicles per day and top speeds of 20 miles per hour. Now, when we were discussing earlier the, um, in previous years the traffic safety around the school, El Dorado K-8, through um, the city had some traffic, um, some traffic studies that showed on, um, in September of 2005, one particular day, they had uh, 2,227 vehicles that they measured on that day um, on the street of, of Tory, the section of Torrey's Peak that stretches between both intersections of Indiana. Um, and that includes the area that we're discussing for development. Um, and then in March of 2006, they had another measurement of 1,981 vehicles. Um, and going back to the tolerable limit that appears to be less than 800 vehicles, that's um, a lot higher. Um, so thereby our concern then is, is the increase in traffic of not only more residents, but also during the, the um, construction period, the construction traffic, the intersection of Indiana and uh, Torrey's Peak is a very busy intersection for both vehicles and pedestrians. Another, uh, another traffic study was where they had measures done in front of the school itself on Indiana and Mount Sopris showed in a given day of 978 vehicles and 561 pedestrians. Um, they don't have a count for that intersection of Indiana and Torrey's Peak, but especially considering all of the, uh, all of the middle school kids that would live on the other side of uh, Colton, and, as well as elementary school kids, and also th that would live on the other side of, of uh, Torrey's Peak as well. There's, it's a huge intersection for pedestrian traffic and has been a very dangerous place. There's um, many near misses, traffic, the stop, light, the stop signs are run very often. Um, so as far as the safety of the pedestrians, the kids, the parents going to and from school, the development of that area is a very big concern for those of us who live in that area and walk to school when we can. Um, also, the, there, in an email from Ellen Miller Brown, who's the vice, I don't know her exact title, she's one of the superintendent, vice superintendent of the, dis, the school district, had mentioned an informal agreement with the city that was um, not to allow pickup in the back of the school, which was along Torrey's Peak, 
in that area that we're talking about um, due to the very high volume of traffic on the narrow residential street there, um, which would then move even more traffic through this set intersection where kids are passing in the, tru the um, school traffic plus the construction traffic um, that we're talking about. Um, we mentioned before as well the overcrowding of the school and um, in a, an email from the superintendent he previously had mentioned the traffic volume and circulation problems evident at El Dorado are a symptom of a larger issue affecting both El Dorado and Superior Elementary schools that is both schools enrollments have exceeded the program design capacity of the buildings. It was mentioned earlier that um, El Dorado K-8 is is over 100 kids over volume at this time and is close to open enrollment. Um, he mentioned the building's design capacity for, our, for El Dorado is 950 students um, and with the portable classrooms already there to accommodate the additional students. He said with the increased enrollment comes additional vehicle trips transporting students to and from school. The large enrollments additionally strain the school's core facilities and compromise learning environments, which of course none of us wants. Um, some people are open enrolling, but that isn't viable to everyone. Um, and we also want to be able to support our neighborhood school. But we also want our kids, more importantly, to have a good learning environment, and we want them to be safe. So I hope that you'll take these things into consideration and let us know when the next meetings are so we can present these yet again for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe, you just, uh, you'll need to know about this too. Somebody has thrown nails all over the parking lot out there. Um, the police have been called, and most of the nails are behind your car. So they just uh, informed us. So careful when you back out. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. No, thank you. Hope it's not the Richland guy with the nails on his <laughs> 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 Good evening, my name is Dave Angus. I live at 3207 Opal Lane. Uh, many of my neighbors have spoken this evening and so I'll try not to uh, repeat what they have covered. I do support what they've said. Um, <clears throat> I just have kind of a, a generic question that you don't need to answer, but it's my understanding that an in impact study will be done, but not until after a transaction is made. Now, I, I heard that secondhand. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Um, but that's kind of what's been milling around in the community. Um, I'm not a city planner, but I can navigate my way around strategies. That one doesn't make sense to me, especially when there's so much at stake. So if that's accurate, then I do request that you look at that. Um, I think you have a couple of problems in the community. There's an image problem, and there's a communication problem. So I hope what you've heard is that we are asking for more open processes. We're not saying that you don't do it. We're saying that we need more and better access to what's going on and would, would appreciate that kind of representation. Um, as it relates to the image problem, I was relieved to see that our hate crimes were so low. If you were to include Richmond in that equation, <laughs> I think the hate crimes would go up significantly. You know, many of us have had to pay thousands of dollars in attorney's fees just to get Richmond's attention to do basic issues. And many of us are left with thousands of dollars of repairs. And Richmond and the way that they've approached us has been less than satisfactory. Um, I encourage you to be wise. I heard I was out in the hall and I didn't hear all the explanations. But I did hear some talk about a one-year warranty that, that generally covers everything. Let me just tell you that it's easy to cover the problems in a year. And Richmond works very well with you in bringing in back soils and doing all those things to help them get through that one-year period. And then once you're in the extended warranty period, it's a nightmare. And you go back and forth between Richmond Homes and between their warranty company, and it is it's hell, okay, to get anything done. So if you do have to consider something like that and you don't listen to the feedback from the community, then be wise and make sure that you hold the builder accountable for some type of extended period of time where they are invested and they can't run away, okay? And 
with that, I will thank you for your service and your time and for your listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Randall Johannes, 3336 Opal Lane, and spoke earlier. And I think you see the, the tenor of the discussion has really softened now that the representatives from Richmond have left. It's just us <clears throat> talking to you. And you can see we, we, we just don't want Richmond. We just don't want them. And Trustee Williams asked a great question. What would you want there? And I live right behind there. And my first request would be a park. I think that would be great. Secondly, maybe a library. But anything but Richmond with smaller homes. Anything but that. That, that just <clears throat> unbelievable. Anyway, um, a couple points I want to make. The tax value of the homes, if they drop by $50,000 because of protest, because of smaller houses, 100 homes go down 50 grand, that's five million a year, that's a lot of tax value lost, lost. And, and you know, it, it's important. In this land, I mean, if we make one wrong decision, this is forever. This is forever. No matter what happens, this is going to change what happens in Spirit forever. So please make the right decision. That's why we've appointed you as trustees, and the word trust is in there because we're trusting you to make the right decision. And uh, I don't know how many of you were here at the November 07 meeting, but there was a lot of discontent at that meeting, and we're kind of surprised that it's come along again after that meeting. So that's why you heard the fury earlier. Um, and the last point I want to make was, again, about the Calmonte property with 75, 77 units scheduled to go over there and only one under contract. How long has that development been in place? Six years, seven years, one sold? That's scary. We do not need 38 more homes. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Holden, 3341 West Torres. Um, I had the pleasure of finding the meetings online the other night. Um, not having any notification that they were streaming online, I was quite surprised. And I managed to watch the whole of the January 12th meeting. And I must say I was surprised and shocked at two items. This one was one of them, where basically the town is selling planning permission for a sum of money on a piece of land. And the other was the storage buildings where the town manager was suggesting that if they gave us $202,000, we would give them the annexing rights. Is that really the way we want to see our town, that planning permission is up for sale? If I want to build condos in my backyard, how much is it going to cost me? Is that really what we're about? And, you know, trustees, yes, we put our trust in you, but you need to be ethical, and I think both those decisions were not ethical. Welcome, George. Good evening, board. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, Mayor, I don't quite approve you pushing this home rule bit towards people in November <laughs> voting. I'm telling you, my opinion has been defeated twice before, and I'm hoping to defeat okay. again. Fair enough. Okay, so we'll drop it there. Secondly, I want to tell you, I missed two meetings. I missed November the 24th, which I had to, and I missed a meeting in December. I want to ask Mr. Randall over there if the contract has been signed with waste, waste uh, connections for the original town, Sagamore, and the Ridge, which was supposed to be signed at the end of the year for the coming year. And today is 9th of February. So, George, uh, let me... Previous, uh, previous, in the minutes, and all, yeah, and no, all the things, it said the contract would be signed at the end of the year. Has it been brought forward to, to the board? I just need to, what is your concern? Because I, I don't think that you're, are you really concerned about whether or not the ink is on the paper? It, it seems like you're trying to broach a bigger subject, so. I want to know if it's signed. Like I said, it was going to be signed by the first of the year. The board approved the sign of a new contract. There is no new contract. The board approved a three-year agreement. It's just automatically renewable, and they signed that agreement in July. What about the end of the year, like they said in the paper? We were going to get I signed. don't know what the paper said, George, but I'm it's not actually. I'm talking about the town paper. The yellow paper, if I've got to go back and bring it to your attention, I sure will. So, so George, okay. uh, what's going on? I, 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 I don't get I've been watching for it ever since you passed it. Yes, but George, is, is there an issue that you're trying to get at, or is it really? Yeah, I want to know when it's, it's okay. signed, if it's going right. to be signed the first year like it was said. It's okay. not going to be signed. That's There's an doing. agreement that was signed in, in July of 2008, and it's valid through December 31st of 2011. 
I'll bring the paper down and show you too. Okay. Now, my train of thought is on the south end of the town, uh, 23 foot street. Our alleys are 20 foot street. It was alleys in town, and we made three more feet. We've had a town manager approve that. We had a public work group approve that. They also approved the whole project. You can't get out of the alley down there on Douglas Street from the south end. They put their culvert in there, their, their drainage. You got a hill like this, people that access that alley or use that alley occasionally, which they have a right to do, cannot use it. I want you people to look at it. I ask you to go down and look. You don't look at the fine print, do you? We drove by. The west side from the bridge, I'm talking about the, the uh, flow line, does not match the original flow line. They don't take somebody to see that stuff. It, like I said, this project was rushed through with this board. And I'm sorry that you didn't have the plans here to look at when you've done it. Because that's a sore point with me down there. It really is. you got to do something right about it. Now, we had such important issues come up. I wish we'd have a full board for all this stuff. It seems like all the important issues in the past two, three or four years, we've always not had a full board. And it seems like it's getting that way all the time. It could be these two or these two. I don't care. But I want to remind you one thing. The three people that initiated the recall, Mary, you're eligible for that recall. Also. <laughs> Thanks and for the everybody, offer. Everybody else on that board is now because it's spent the time long enough here. I'm not saying they will do that, but I'm telling you it's been rumored. So take it as it is. Right, can I take something? Thank you. Something? Trustee Gregoris. Uh, George? I think you're right that we, we try to be here at these important meetings, but I just want you to know for Trustee D'Souza, for example, her daughter had surgery today. That's why she's not here. So there are legitimate reasons, and Trustee Rosenfeld is out of town. I'm just saying overall. On business. All right. I'm not, say, I'm not picking on her. I'm not picking on her. Uh, I just say maybe she schedule your important events when everybody's here. That's what they run to the board and said they would be here. So... That's we try to, but there's life and illness <laughs> and jobs, and yeah. you know we don't get paid for this <laughs> no, <laughs> a whole not. lot. So I have some milk, but can't think of right. yeah. You know, you know where to find us. I know where to find. Good evening. My name is Jason Mitchum. I live at 3020 North Torrey's Peak, and uh, I may have missed this part of the discussion earlier, but it's kind of an open question to anyone who can answer it. Um, I'm wondering why. Why the town board or, or the town manager thinks the swap is a good idea? In other words, what's the other side of the story? You know, is there a financial benefit that accrues to the town, and if so, what is it? And, and if it's not a financial benefit that the town is after, you know, uh, possibly what what are the benefits, stated or unstated thus far, of owning um, the property on Oakland and Castle? Someone address that. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it again. Great question, um, by the way. Great question. Mm -hmm. So what, what would prompt the board to do anything like this? Obviously, we don't do it for, to win popularity <coughs> contests here. Um, it, it has to do with uh, community planning issues. So there's some – these are – and chime in if you have the other upsides from this. But one, I try not to be too parochial about uh, the school district. Uh, I, many of us have children in the schools right now. Uh, we think that a $400,000 benefit to BVSD, even if it might not be going to the school district, is a significant asset. Um, we uh, have been looking for ways to uh, build community meeting spaces. And once again, I said earlier that I'm not committing that that's actually happening on the cor corner of Colton and McCaslin. But that property is uh, somewhat more central. I mean, obviously you drove down here, so you know it's not really central to the town of Superior, but it's somewhat more central to the area, has better access to it, it has uh, better uh, trails to it. So we think that that's potentially a significantly uh, better location if we were to proceed with community meeting spaces, libraries, or whatever. Um, and the property is significantly more valuable uh, compared to the property uh, that's the school site. So, well, Why does the town actually need to own it, though? 
in order to let development happen or economic benefit from that development occur? It has to do with because Richmond owns the property on the corner, and so for that transaction to occur, they are part of the party. They are one of the parties of the Boulder Valley School District. So unless Richmond wants it to be developed, it's not going to be developed. And on the corner of Colton? Right. We have restrictions of what ha is happening there, uh, so it's commercial space. You know, we there's commercial space across the street at Calmonte, the other half of it. Uh, you know, it's I'd be also surprised. People have brought up that they think it's going to be, they'd be surprised if significant commercial activity uh, would happen over there. I, I think that that's probably true. But we would have the opportunity to rezone that into community space or whatever. And once again, I. I want to be clear that I'm not saying that that's what's happening there, but it would give the town much more flexibility about additional uh, community planning. So we think there's significant upside for that, and there's an added benefit that the school district has $400,000 uh, in their pocket. So uh, that doesn't accrue to us, and we think we're just being good neighbors regarding that issue. So, Okay. All right. Well, interesting, interesting rationale, but I appreciate the, the you know, openness and honesty about it. The, uh, the the other comment I'll make, I guess, is uh, the lady was here before talking about the traffic statistics on on Taurus Peak in Indiana. There, but um, at any given point in time of the day, you can actually watch people catching air as they fly through the stop sign um, going across Taurus Peak. So I invite all of you guys to come down there and see that intersection because it's a it's a scary place. You know, I don't let my daughter walk to, you know, to school because of that. It's just pretty kind of funny. Okay. Um, and the last thing I'll say is just I, I would say. If there's a, you know, the financial benefits of doing that swap, or the the other benefits, right? Let's just be upfront and open about them, about you know, quantifying what those are. If the town board has designs on, you know, putting in, uh, you know, a rec center or a library or whatever else the town wants to use it for, you know, state it up front. This is this is why we're pursuing. It. I think that I think that is one of the yep. issues. So, yep. mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hope that that hasn't been. I don't think we're trying to be. Uh, obfuscational. I don't know if I can use that as a <laughs> word, but you know, it's, we try to be a, as clear and upfront as possible. Right. And you know, we're here every Monday, so it's more clear cut to us. And you know, obviously, until it affects you, then not a lot of people are down here, and so it's hard for that communication. I mean, we we strive hard in terms of communication. We do whatever we can. And let's see, who watched the web streaming uh, recently? I so, <laughs> brand new. So I'm glad that brand you new. glad you watched it Just because happened. that's a, that's an additional. I mean, we try to put out the community newsletter. We do the CIC list and we post agendas on it. We have Channel Eight. I mean, it's it's a difficult problem for government to be as to communicate as much as possible, and we we try to go out of our way to do that. And if you if people have other suggestions about how to communicate, we're we're all ears here about that. So. Um, We'd love to hear what your thoughts would be. <clears throat> Sorry. Just take a gross. Yeah. If there's a, a perception that there's something secretive going on behind your backs, that's definitely not the case. However, having said that, the question that you brought out in public and you're being televised tonight, I've had 10 different people ask me in the last week about it, personally through email. Right. So somehow we're not getting that information out up front. And as a result of that, I think you have rumors, and then things spread like a wildfire, and then things get twisted, and it's not exactly accurate. So I'm glad you brought you. That's exactly the same question, word for word, that I received from several people living in the community. So. Yep. Yeah, and I think most people, you know, certainly for myself, it's true that I get all my information about the community mostly, or mostly of it, from the email list. So if it hasn't shown up on the email list in a, you know, a big, bright, bold, declarative statement, uh, it probably hasn't gone through to me. So. Well, we. Read the town newsletter. It's just I'm just going to plug that. So you know, we try to put as much information in there as possible. So um, you know, we try to communicate through there. So, but Great. thanks for your comments. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Thank you. May I uh, ask sure. for one clarification for the record? Mm -hmm. um, I understand the desire for commercial development along Colton and at McCaslin. Um, in many ways, I probably support that. Um, frankly, this ice rink I hear combined with a bowling alley, all under the umbrella of a wonderful rec center for our children with an arcade. Sounds great to me. It's a way to keep my teenagers off the street, etc. That commercial development, however, hinging on anything to do with Richmond confuses me. If this uh, property in question by my house is made into a park, as we thought when we bought it, or school property or whatever. But anyway, it accrues to the city free of charge. 
Um, nothing precludes that development from happening at Colton and McCaslin except the fact that Richmond owns the property. However, that property can be bought from Richmond. There is a price for that property, and it can be bought from Richmond. And I think if I can speak for the people uh, that I've spoken so much to over the course of the past week, buy it from Richmond, get Richmond out of here forever into eternity, and develop it wisely for the benefits of the community. But in no way is dependent on a swap to occur to have that development happen. So that's an outstanding question, and that's the crux of the issue um, right there is the you know, we could put, yeah, of course we could buy this property from Richmond, but is it a financially prudent way for the town to do that? And people will agree or disagree about the way to do that, but that property is a, a whole big chunk of change. Well, what I will contend, again, that Richmond will continue to hold that over your head to get what they want, which is the space for 38 homes by our house. And the, the, the party we continue not to hear in this little triumvirate of town B of its, B at VSD and Richmond is the homeowner, the resident, the current resident of this town. And we need to start hearing them in this equation. But if we are serious about making, uh, uh, trying to preserve the, uh, the rink in this community, we don't have a bowling alley. We don't have a rec center. Citizens have called for a rec center numerous times. Let's float that as a bond issue to the city and see if we residents of the town are willing to pay for it. It's a great question. We've done it twice, and it's it failed twice. It but not in, the context, twice, not in the context of moving the rink, adding a bowling alley, doing the arcade, and again, if we include citizens in on this discussion and make it less a generic rec center and make it something that we can visualize how our kids will use, I do believe we're going to be willing to pay for it through use taxes, et cetera, or you know, property tax, however it is you guys do all that new stuff. You saw me here Absolutely. tonight. If, if, if we do this wisely, I think you're going to have a lot of citizen support. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comments? So uh, I think we'll. Mm, okay. I just want to make sure that we have all the public comment that we are going to have. So I do want to thank everybody for coming down here. This is an incredibly emotional, uh, emotionally charged issue. Your home is your single biggest investment that most of us will ever have. And we're concerned about the education of our kids. You know, once again, many of us up here have kids in the school district. Mine are currently in, in SES, but they'll be going to uh, El Dorado here shortly. So I, I totally get that. My daughter's in a portable at, at Superior right now, so I get that issue as well. So once again, the whole issue is what is a financially responsible way to proceed with these uh, interact uh, these dealings? You know, the town uh, budget right now. Uh, is I think that we have reserves of about nine million. That sort of ballpark, maybe. Mr. Randall can unrestricted. That is, I mean, we have some other issues, but so we would, if we were going to purchase the property for Richmond, we would take a whole bunch of that reserve and remove it, which is probably not a good strategy in terms of our credit rating. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of that that goes into that issue. So I don't think recently. So I'm sure that we, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I want to hear all these things. If you could come to the mic, that that would be great. Once again, I, it's just a public meeting, and I need, need to be people at the mic. Thirty-two eighty-two West Torrey's Peak. We were the first homeowners actually on West Torrey's Peak in the year two thousand. Um, I guess my question is, and what has bothered me about this, is why are we continuing to view this as one is contingent on the other? Why, is this, why does this have to be a package deal? To me, that is not responsible development. To me, we need to look at any development that we do on either piece of land on its own merit, on what the net impact is to the surrounding community on this development, separately from what is the net impact on the surrounding community for this development. 
both things can happen. A park can happen, and whatever you want to happen for that commercial piece of property can happen. It's just maybe going to take a little bit more time to figure out how to do it. And but my money. understanding from what I'm hearing, and I don't know if this is right or not, um, that property at Colton that you that you really want to acquire has been on the market for quite a while, right? Uh, I think forever since Richmond has been here. Richmond is unable to sell it. Richmond does not feel it's viable to develop. Correct. I mean, can't we wait a few more years? I mean, the way the market is going right now, whatever they think that land is worth, it's not worth that because no one has purchased it. That, that would be one way. That's so I just one don't way think of doing that it. acquiring this piece of land, how, how are we assuming that acquiring this piece of land is worth all the damage and the destruction on the residential side of it over here? It's almost kind of like a game show. Let's make a deal. Do you want window number one or window number two? Or do we want to just responsibly develop each right. piece based on its own merit? And that's all I would ask of you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Payne, 2475 Clayton Circle. Just given the um, last uh, few exchanges, I would make the comment and point out that um, given the two parcels of land and the fact that it's a swap, it ultimately will affect residents in and around the other piece of land. Mm -hmm. um, and I live closer to that piece of land. <laughs> so I don't have any particular advocacy here uh, either way. I just want to suggest that um, some attempt be, be made to reach out to the residents next to the other parcel at the same time that this is being discussed because they might have some input. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Can I see something? I oh, good girls. Oh. I can. Those homeowners, yeah. when they bought their properties, knew that that was zoned commercial. Mm -hmm. That was fact. It remains fact. So they knew to expect that, unlike we homeowners near El Dorado K-8. Okay. Trustee Kogoros. I lost my thought now, but <laughs> your hand is up. No, you robbed me of my. Oh, I think in 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 the order of transparency and inclusiveness of everybody in Rock Creek, I think the I think we need to rethink the 500 uh, yards honestly and make it open to the entire town. Yeah. I would personally propose that. So, Mr. Randall, do you want? Can, can I explain? Yes, it's please. been misrepresented yes. tonight that we changed the rules for the worst. Uh, well, First of did, all, we did change the rules. We changed the rules, yes. but not for the worst. Exactly. In fact, how the rules have changed since November of 2007. It is the developer who makes an application, and we're not there yet, but it, when a developer makes an application, our code has always required that there be a notice to all property owners within 500 feet of that particular development, the outer perimeter. So contrary to the con conversation, there are numerous residents within 500 feet of the 160-acre town center site. How we changed the process, and it came right after the Richmond proposal of November 2007 and said, whenever we're having these kinds of discussions, conceptual plan reviews, we should make the developer provide notice as well because it's just as important to provide people with information at the conceptual process rather than just the planning commission and the town board final decision. That's how the rules changed. The notice that you got last for last Monday's meeting and for tonight's meeting is a new obligation. It did not exist before November of 2007. So please don't characterize it as a representation that we changed the rules and it made it more egregious. Now, whether, it needs, whether the rules need to be amended and changed, but recognize it's the developer's responsibility to provide notice, and we can decide whatever radius we want it to do. And we're talking about, in this instance, there was complaints, well, why did the developer only notify 102 or 104 houses? If we want to make the responsibility of the developer to provide notice to every one of the 5,000 households that exist within the town, we can do that. I guess that I was proposing actually exactly that to expand. And it's not 5,000 yep. homes, it's 2,800. But anyway, that's not the point. No, it is 5,000. We just did a mailing last week to every within, household within in Rock Creek. Within there's more to this. There's more to the town of Superior than Rock no, Creek. But this particular issue affects Rock Creek the most. But that's you right. can't you can't pick and choose. <laughs> no. Okay. I I would suggest though that actually what you want to do is to do a mailing whenever you're doing a planning zoning change like the meeting of the 12th to everyone in Rock Creek, that, or everyone in the town, because that's the notification we didn't get. You'd made your decision to work with 
with this agreement, the changes to the agreement with Richmond and with BBSD, we didn't get any notification of that. So yes, we come to a planning review, but that's not what we need to discuss. It's the zoning review that you held on January 12th that we should have been notified of. Okay. All right. Apostle of Desley said one three Maroon Peak. You mentioned before that you do not know what the cost of this parcel would be, you know, I mean that each one is trying to sell for quite a while and they cannot do that. And you mentioned as well that this would not be fiscally responsible for the town to go and acquire that and get the reserves down for the amount of money you have. I would tell you if it's legally possible. Um, if you would put that, let's say again, with the elections, whenever they are, or when, if we can wait that long, into the ballot uh, that we buy, if the money that we have is allowed, you know, I mean, if it's $50 million, yeah, you cannot get there. But if it's three, four, five, six, I don't know what the number is, again, unless we do that. If you put that in a vote for the pe to the people of Superior to buy that lot right out of Richmond and do the other place that we suggested next to the school as a... Uh, as a park, and at the same time, of course, have the people take the responsibility among, of course, with you, that the results will be done, I can, I, I can tell you what the answer will be. Okay. Thank you. Additional public comment? Okay. Seeing none, we're you've done the presentations already. We're on to item number six with the consent agenda. Remeeting, uh, on the consent agenda is the approval of the minutes for January 20th, 2009 special meeting and the January 26, 2009 regular meeting, acceptance of the minutes for the planning commission, adoption of a resolution approving a contract with Coblanco that services Inc. for clarifloculator painting for a superior metropolitan district number one, adoption of a resolution appointing members to the historical commission, appointments of town board liaisons to the advisory commissions and committees, Preliminary approval of an ordinance amending Chapter 11 of the Superior Municipal Code regarding street sidewalks and public property. Approval of an amended final development plan for Discovery Office Park Monument sign. Approval of a license agreement for Discovery Office Park Monument sign. And that's it. Motion by Trustee Skumas. Second by Trustee Gouros. Discussion? Yes. Sorelli. Our item 6C, I'd like to ask about that. 6C? Okay. Uh, just jumps out at me the, the tremendous disparity in the bids. Uh, although the the one that is being recommended is close to the estimate, is there any sense of what happened there as far as the rest of those bids being so far out? No, you'll notice we had the same experience last year when the bids ranged from 82 to 25. And in fact, that's why we missed the budget, because we knew it was 25 last year when we budgeted 30-something this year, and we still missed it. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm confident that there was no misreading of the specifications. We were pleased with the company, not this company, but the company's work last year, um, and that it's gonna, we're going to get what we're paying for. Uh, normally, I would have those concerns, but we, don't, we didn't in this instance. I think it's, it's a product of workload. It is a very specialized type of work. Not any, this isn't just regular painting, obviously. It's tenemic paint. It's a very, I don't want to say hazardous, but it's its a limited clientele that can do this work. Trustee Skumatz? Just that I have to um, not vote on A, I wasn't at the January Okay. Trustee Gregoris, did you have something? I did not. Trustee Williams? Yes. Uh, I was curious about G. Um, with the uh, plans, I... It seems to say that it's six feet, or I'm sorry, eight feet, six inches tall. But I'm uh, reading in um, our report that it's 11 feet tall. Ooh. Which one is it? I think it's 11 feet. <coughs> Even though the, the plans are showing eight feet, six inches. That might be above the base. And that's the color gray green. Mr. Magley, I see you coming to a chair. Are you able to speak to that issue? That's after he's cleaned up the driveway <laughs> or the parking. <laughs> um, your question again, I'm sorry. Okay. So <laughs> in the report, it mm -hmm. says in G um, that it is 11 feet 
tall. Correct. Although in the details in the plan, it's showing eight feet six inches tall. So which which one is it? <laughs> That's it. Um, well, technically, it's, it's, what it, it's, it's whatever's in the plan. Difference, right? To, yeah. to me, it is. After going through looking at all the different signs and how how tall they are. Which one is it? I'll have to check the plans. Okay, I'm looking at the plans yeah. for right it, it now. It does say eight six, and whether that's because of the curved arch. It's actually measuring the curved no, I, arch. I, I, I don't you don't think so? Take that away from it. it I'm, I don't know for certain, but yeah, the side so, the side elevation doesn't show you necessarily the then full, full peak or reach of the arch. To the top of the base of the column. To something above that is showing. I don't know. It's not showing a specific number, but it's from the bottom of the base all the way to this top part, it's showing eight feet six inches. Right. Correct. So is that, that, that the is, arc? That is the correct height of the sign. That is the correct. Wow. Height. It's not eleven feet. Welcome yeah. to eight Fred feet, Fox, Town Planner. Would so you like to speak to this issue? Eight feet six inches, not eleven feet. <laughs> correct. Correct. All right. How are you? Sorry. What was the answer? I'm sorry. Eight feet six inches. It's what's ever in the plans. That's what we dropped in. The plan is always right. The plan's always right. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So, like, that's significant, sorry. and uh, that makes me much more happy. Trustee Schumacher. Trustee Schumacher. Yes, sorry, he was answering part of my question. Um, I, I didn't see. I don't. Do I see things in here about the um, the planning commission was okay with it? Six to one. Yes. And um, are the sizes of the individual, individual size signs larger, smaller, consistent with whatever, for instance, the signage that's for Chicago pizza, the, the one that goes into Chicago pizza, et cetera, and all that larger, smaller? I suspect cells. larger. Yeah, the panels are going to be slightly larger than what you see, um, simply because um, at, you're dealing with a signalized intersection so you have traffic that's stopped whereas for this monument sign you've got people going 45 miles an hour so they wanted the letters to be larger so that people could seem easier can you show me how big sort of i believe the letters are three inches tall three and a half inches three and a half yeah. inches tall so. and the panels i believe are six inches in each. Can I also ask how many people um, came before the planning commission? Is that allowable question? Good. Mm -hmm. we, comments right we had public comment from two individuals. Thank you. You were opposed to it. Further discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor of the consent agenda? Oh, we need We're spending money. Are we spending money? Yes. yes. Sorry. Thanks. I didn't see that one. Uh, yes, the painting. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thanks. Item number seven reports, questions, and issues. Uh, would like to start. Trustee Skumas. Sure. Okay. Um, number one, I'm very happy to say that it took me about five minutes to get my library card, and they were extremely accepting, and we're very happy to see the superior residents and families back in the library, reading room, etc. So thank you for working out the agreement, and um, I'm glad that we were able to come to a satisfactory and productive solution. Um, number two, um, I circulated a, a note around to board members, and I don't know when this kind of stuff comes, when legislative type stuff comes up, but um, there's, there's some legislation that's working its way through committees where city, cities can apply for grants and for recycling and other things, or recycling type things, and, and 
if it keeps moving forward, it increases the chances it will pass. It's it's something where where if it passes, then the fu the only funds in the state that are available for cities to apply for recycling grants gets completely wiped out and taken over by the university. The university is a nice and you know, noble cause and all that, but the university has millions and millions and millions of dollars, and recycling has about 600,000 right now, and sometimes it's as tire. much as a million for an entire, for all of anything related to recycling in this in the state. It would, I think, um, I'm on the CML executive board, and in order to get the CML to, to consider um, opposing it, which it hasn't waded in its feet yet, <coughs> um, I think having some communities oppose it leads them to feel like that's an issue that cities care about. So my request would be that the board considers um, opposing, coming out opposing SB 52, which I understand Boulder and Boulder County have done, and I and I heard that Fort Collins, or I got an email that said Fort Collins also did. So that's my request. And so this is the uh, the funds generated off of uh, waste, tire. waste tires, yes, right? So it's uh, recycling to right. recycling, rather than taking something recycling oriented and applying it to something, you know. Completely unrelated. Thank you for asking. Uh, so I think you know. I don't know if I circulated this. It, it was under my own signature, but I uh, sent a letter to the Senate uh, committee that was considering this. That I can't remember which committee that was. Um, and I got a polite answer back from them that it would pass out of committee, and so it's moving forward uh, for further discussion. Um, so um, I would encourage anybody that has any feelings about that issue to call your local representative or send them a, a message. Um, you know, they seem to be very open to that suggestion. I would, I would encourage CML to take a position on that as well. So, And what I'm, uh, um, what I'm suggesting is that CML is less likely to do so if communities don't, some communities don't oh. show that they care about this issue enough to say, gee, we'd like this not to go forward. So I that's what I'm suggesting. And I, don't, and I know we take some stands late on but sometimes that's if 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 it can be worded at committee level, then it's a lot less hassle than waiting to the last possible minute when um, it's mm -hmm. got more legs. If that makes sense. So it, I'm I'm happy to take whatever feedback the board. If you're not happy to do that, that's fine. But I figured why not ask? Uh, so, but once again, I. I weighed in, uh, yeah. sending them a letter, and I guess uh, we can see if the town board is interested in weighing in officially as a as, as an board. entity. I, mean, I, I think in general we've been very supportive of recycling, so I can't imagine that we're going to say take the money away from recycling. So, but I had friends, you know, that were that were down testifying, and they said, yes, the committee was very polite, as you said, but voted unanimously that you mm -hmm. know they said that the the chair of that committee was friends with the guy from, that was presenting from the university and. Felt like it was a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. so. Would it send a stronger message if we did it as a town board? That's what I'm suggesting. As, as yes. I, I, would be okay I recall with. your the materials you sent us, the uh, committee was expecting no opposition. That's right. And I, I, honestly, I think that this is going to pass at the state house because uh, higher education is on the top of their agenda of things that they want to fund, and so I'd be surprised if it would not pass. But. But sorry, I'm sorry to see uh, Colorado next to Louisiana and um, Mississippi in terms of its recycling. So. Well, we're right there in education, too. <laughs> no, we're not. Pretty low. 42nd or something no. like that. Yeah, yeah. We are. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, okay. I, would, I would support that as a board. So do I need well, to draft one something. question. I did have a question. It wasn't clear to me. The material, the, the funds. Is it clear that the funds that are raised from those fees are allowed to be used for studies of recycling in general? Yeah. Or? It says, created in 2000, um, the the bill which was HB 00 1430 instituted a fee on waste tire disposal and put into the statute that 100 percent of the ATF funds quote shall be used solely to finance research, development, and technology transfer with regard to waste diversion and recycling strategies, and shall include research, development, and technology related to waste tires as well. Okay. So it wasn't just waste tires. So I thought maybe we were getting there already. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So um, you'll have to draft some. You have to draft something, and then probably actually get it approved formally at a board meeting for the town to take a specific action. Okey doke. But you're not getting gags. Not at all. Okay, I will do so. Mm -hmm. And other than that, I think I had two other meetings that I've been to over the last couple of weeks, and nothing critical came out of either of them except that I hope everyone has the day March 4th penciled in on their calendars for the meeting on revenue stability. And I'll help carpool anybody that wants to. <gasps> and fill out the survey about the May May question mark date working working session where we know trail building. Right. With the other boards from around Boulder County. I told a uh, former trustee in Bureau when I saw her at the Rocky Flats Coalition that uh, they should uh, Boulder County should support a uh, a prize for the highest turnout in terms of uh, local um, board members. So That's she was going to contemplate that. Oh, I thought we were already doing that. So well, I wasn't sure whether or not that actually happened. So along with mayors that run in the municipal. Yeah, yes, exactly absolutely. the number. <laughs> How many mayors was that? No, that's one. right. No, one. one. Oh, wow. So. Thank you. Is this really anything from you? No, except why is it always windy on Monday? I don't know. <laughs> so the trash can blow down the street. Did you get gross? Jesse Williams? I have nothing to report at this time. I have one extra trash bin. From my neighbors, so <laughs> come see me. Very good. Uh, let's see. I had, I think, just one meeting since last we spoke, which was the Rocky Flats Coalition, uh, actually Rocky Flats Stewardship Council, uh, which was an annual um, quarterly review of the remediation at Rocky Flats. And I'm um, glad to state that actually everything is going very well. They've repaired some uh, remediation dams uh, and they're talking about way to do cost-effective control of uranium and nitrates that are coming off the site but um, it's actually moving along very well uh, and I think that was everything of import from that meeting we actually I'm leaving tomorrow morning uh, to go to DC to lobby for continued funds for Rocky Flats uh, ongoing legacy management issues and for US 36 corridor um, specifically for the multimodal transit solutions for US 36 so I'll have more next meeting Do well. we'll see how it goes there's you know it's uh, it's amazing when dollars come when people start talking about a stimulus package everybody is going to Washington DC to ask for you know recycling of wood paneling to whatever so we'll see how we rank out there Mr. Randall. Since we didn't get to it during the workshop session, a quick review of the next agenda. Agenda item C is the second reading of Chapter 11. Again, pertains to streets, sidewalks, and public property. A couple of those items uh, were raised as a result of the board's review of code enforcement issues. Most significantly, the issue that came out of our code enforcement review that has been incorporated into the first draft is the prohibition or the restriction on dumpsters in the rights of way. And the discussion the guidance that we got from the board and the way the ordinance has been amended is that dumpsters can only be placed in the right-of-way or will only be able to be placed in the right-of-way if they can't be accommodated on the private property. The driveway is too short that it would hang over the sidewalk, that there's no ample space in the side yard to accommodate it. But the applicant would have to ask for the permit rather than just the unilateral right to dump a, a big obstruction on the, at the curb. And Scott, I've seen more and more actually on the driveways recently, which I'm, I'm delighted to see. As I'm driving up and down the streets, I see more and more. And they fit. I, I mean, have to. I mean, most of them fit. Same with the storage pods. I'm seeing more of them. Not because of any communication or rule changes. Maybe it was just because of the discussion. But uh, I, I've, I've noticed some more. But again, that's probably the most significant change and certainly the one that comes out of the the board's discussion regarding code enforcement. The other one that is significant, oh, and I don't know if it was one Can I add one more thing about that? Sure. I, I've noticed there are a couple, and I'm trying to remember the exact uh, location, where it's dark and at night, if you don't have your license, if you're not, yeah, and there's huge. Right, so. Wh which oh, one? Okay. No, I'm going to say. Yeah, and I mean, you can, and there's no reflector light in front of it. I'm telling you, I'm surprised nobody's like, crashed into one of those things. It's gotten lax. Uh, our ordinance does require that dumpsters be reflectorized. They have to have people, that. People have frequently done things like put out a cone or a barricade 
It isn't the same. If it's not under yeah. a light oh, and it's like in a dark section of the street, it's it's exactly so. No doubt about it. But again, it becomes a proactive petition or petition application and a permit issue rather than just it's it's there and it's there for the duration of my basement remodel right, and right. construction project, whatever it might be. The other one, and I don't again know if it was one of the issues that was raised from the audience concerns, but it clarifies the property owner's responsibility for maintaining adjacent public right of way. We all know it's our responsibility to shovel our sidewalk, oh, yeah. even though we don't own our sidewalk. It's our responsibility in those instances where you have a parkway, the, area, the grassy area between the curb and the sidewalk, it's your responsibility as the adjacent property owner to cut it. We don't cut it, even though it's public right of way. The ordinance has been clarified to make to hmm. you know, hopefully make it clearer that that is the responsibility of the adjoining property. Um, bids. Uh, we expect to have uh, phase one of the four phase irrigation controllers on the next agenda. I've been promising this for weeks. I'm hoping that we'll be in a position to be recommending a town engineer contract. Um, part of it was the sheer volume of responses we got. Now it's the process of actually negotiating the best possible rate that we can. Um, you do have the public hearing and ordinance regarding the annexation agreement and plan, uh, preliminary plan development for guardian storage, which is coming back. Uh, and then we have the two items on the, on the workshop session. Uh, another conceptual plan review. This is for resolute investments for what used to be the Horizon site, the long mm. stretch between Tyler and Flatirons on Colton. They'll be coming forward there with their mixed-use development. Very similar to what you saw about a year ago, except there's no residential. Office, hotel, and retail are the components that are included within that plan. And the second item on our workshop agenda is the uh, recommendations or the, the proposed work programs for each of your five advisory boards and commissions. And then just a couple of items in terms of follow-up from the digest. We had, I, I misspoke the date earlier, the special town work, board workshop session on the pavement management plan and the 20-year CIP is Monday the 16th, not the 9th. The 9th would be our second second Monday and would be our regular meeting. I did include information, and it was not because of the discussion you were having tonight, I've done it every year, about real estate market statistics. And it's not just spin in the positive, you've got bad, some of the bad stuff too, but the fact that on a whole, residential real estate in Superior is far better than it is anywhere else in, in the county, anywhere within Boulder or Broomfield counties, by almost every measurable you know, indicator in terms of price escalation, average days on market. The one indicator that we, and we heard it was validated tonight, uh, the numbers were a little bit different, was the total number of units sold, both condominiums and single family homes. The total sales went down, but even the days on market increased by one. In 07 it was 58, last year it was, or in, in, in 07 it was 58 days, and in 08 it was 59 days. Still by far the best in terms of trying to sell a single family property anywhere within Boulder or Broomfield counties. And I think I probably said this a year ago, when property values based on recent sales increased a little over 5% last year between those homes that sold in 07 and those homes that sold in 08 increased 5.5%, 5, 5 .5 again, one of the largest increases within the region. That may feel stagnant when you, you, for those of you that have been here for a decade and have been spoiled by double digit increases, but residential real estate in Superior still is escalating even despite the down market, and I wanted to get that across. And hopefully that was information was helpful to you. And the last is the Library Services Agreement. Obviously, as Lisa indicated, services did commence on Friday. Most of our mailers got received by Friday. Some trickled in on Saturday. I hope you got them. We had a chorus line going on in here in terms of the stamping, folding, getting them out once we knew that the agreement was done on Tuesday night, uh, wanting to get it into people's hands as quickly as possible. Uh, we will actually be giving them the check next week, and I think I shared with you, because of the it wasn't effective on February 1st, but on February 6th, it was a little bit less than we'd reported before, I think $103,000. That's, That's all I have. Mr. Like Gross? Yeah, just a quick question. Did we get the final numbers for December? I'm just kind of for last revenue to see how 2008. No. Not yet, huh? Sales, sales tax information generally comes in about seven weeks, okay. so I would expect it. I keep asking because I'm very curious to see how we do with We all are. Sales. Yeah, okay. I had one comment on the digest also. Yes. The meeting with the committee chairs and yes. the and that I was really happy with the results of that. I hope that they that the committees felt that that was productive, but it seemed their 
suggestions were, oh my gosh, I'm surprised we didn't do it that way, or we should have thought of doing it that way in the first place. So I was very happy with those results. Thank you for raising that, because I intended, I meant to, to comment on it. It was very well received. They were very happy at the time that we spent last Monday night in the, in the session. It was unfortunate that I came out of a rather cantankerous you know, meeting with uh, and some real estate development immediately before that. Uh, and I thought each of their suggestions had merit. I hope you're comfortable with them. It would be my suggestion that we do incorporate those, uh, that we share all the work plans with all the groups, not just those uh, that had submitted them, that they make their presentations under the presentations rather than citizen sense. comment. And, I, and you had a committee chair tonight who stood up as a resident, gave his home address, not his title, to be able to distinguish between that asking them as well to give us the material that they'd like to have presented so you get it in your agenda packet, aren't going to get surprised at the microphone. Uh, they did ask if they would be consulted before you remove somebody because there may be extenuating cir circumstances that they would like to share with you before the board just take up. Uh, That's the one I assumed we already did, so that one surprised me. So We hadn't talked about it, but I thought they, it was excellent. And then I love the other one. Let's get back together again in a year and see how it's all working. Outstanding. So. <laughs> Trustee Williams? Yes, I have one more question uh, about the library. Did you, or were we able to clarify um, if the uh, Louisville Library card actually works at other libraries? I indicated in my conversations with Malcolm, the city manager in Louisville, that that was one of the, while we didn't do that in the memorandum of understanding and all the rest, uh, that that was one of our issues or concerns and that we would want to have language incorporated that talked about, when we talked about full service, it wasn't just the hours and services provided at that building. It's what Louisville we residents were, get. We were expecting full reciprocity. His response was that is certainly a very reasonable request and we will work on it with our neighbors. Okay. So I expect that in the next 60 days as we're drafting the IGA, between us and Louisville, we'll have that confirmed. All right. And then just one, just related to the town manager, we uh, owe him our evaluation, and you have a survey monkey tool in your in basket. Please uh, work on filling it out if you haven't done it yet. Okay. Miss Carberry. All right. I do that too. What's that? I don't have anything. Miss Harden, anything from you? I just want to remind you that the meeting on the 23rd of uh, March spring break and we will be on a meeting. So I'll keep I think you can told that. I don't think it was in the digest, but I just want for the record for the public that we won't have a meeting on the twenty third of March. We will not wait on the twenty third. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Nobody's ever here. Yeah, Nobody's ever here, right? You, you can't get a quorum when That's fine. I'm out of town, so cool. I'm here. I'm there. Okay. We're out of town, but we're together. It's on my calendar. I'm going to a meeting. I'm out of town. Out of town. Oh, <laughs> I'm out of town, I think. Thank you for that reminder. Yes. All right, thanks. Uh, with that, let's move on to item number eight, which is an executive session to consider the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of real, personal, or other property pursuant to CRS 24-6-402, print 4, print 8. Motion by Trustee Skuma, second. Can I, can I ask a question about that? Okay. Is that something that we have to do tonight, given that we have two members missing, or is that do We're we... Not, uh, or can it wait two weeks, or is it something that we discussion need? Discussion. It's a just We need to... I'm okay. I just want to ask a question. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. It Some of the material is timely. Okay, then that, let's do it. That's fine. Okay. Can, we, can, we, can we wait five minutes? <laughs> we can wait five minutes. Certainly. We can wait five minutes. Uh, motion by Trustee Skuma, second by I'll Trustee second. Garth or Williams. Or Williams, how about it? Yeah, put me uh, on there. All in favor? Unanimous. We're in executive session. Thank you very much for coming tonight.